What you have to understand is that I never had a plan. There's not, there's not one second ever that I was like, here's a business plan. I'm going to pursue this. It was totally an accident. You know, this is just a wave that I'm riding and it's paying the bills. And I keep waiting for the wave to crest and it doesn't. You know, <laughs> like I keep waiting for the wave to crest and it doesn't crest. I still treat it like I'm in the basement of our first house on a Saturday morning sipping coffee in my, you know, in my jammies and just being totally passionate about the fact that I'm super into M1 helmets right now. She's my kind of woman. I need a soul. One of the biggest questions that I get from people outside of my sphere, so if I'm at the gym and I'm yucking it up with some guy and he's like, oh, hey, what do you do for a living? I always have this moment of like, you know, how do I answer this question? I always kind of snicker and I say, well, I, I sell army helmets. <laughs> and you get this look. And the question always is, is who, who wants one? What I usually say to, to get, you know, to get the guy at the gym, to get his mind funneled in that direction is, well, a reenactor, have you ever been to a Civil War event? Oh, yeah, 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 we've seen a Civil War battle. Everyone's seen a Civil War battle. Well, it's like a Civil War battle, except they reenact World War II. And then they're like, oh, I didn't know that was a thing. And I'm like, yeah, it's a, it's a total thing. Like, it's an industry. got your reenactors and you've got your living historians they kind of think that they're part of the same world but they're separate they're like an a and a b equation but the the collectors are are where you know that's where your all walks of life comes into because everyone's going to have a hobby you know your hobby might be bicycling your hobby might be fixing up a car their hobby is collecting army stuff People that are in M1 helmets, and you can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be a professor, it doesn't matter what walk of life you've come from. If you like to collect M1 helmets, you're really into it. The guys that collect them, we call it the disease, and you get this disease and you can't have enough of them. Right, at, right about the time, I, I believe 1998, 1999, my cousin said, hey, let's go see a movie. And so we went and saw um, Saving Private Ryan. You know, you, you, you can look back on it now and, and, and critique it a little bit more, but when it, was, when it was happening in real time, when that movie came out, it was quite revolutionary. Visually, it was engrossing, like you were in it. That rekindled for me, you know, I hadn't talked to my grandpa about his time in service for years. And so then I was, all of a sudden, I was just like, it's all I could think about. And so I would pick his brain. We did a lot of research on him, his time in service. He found some of his old shipmates. I actually have a video that a guy shot on board his ship during World War II, that guy shot with a Super 8. I mean, that really just, I mean, I'm 28 years old. I'm on fire for this. And through all that, then I stumbled upon a flea market and I, I bought some military items. And my brother-in-law told me about eBay and that buying and selling and then I you know I picked up an M1 helmet at a show and I think I paid forty dollars for it and I put it on eBay you know penny auction it ended up selling for like 85 and I'm like Brenda I doubled my money and she's like good keep going <laughs> okay that I didn't know you were gonna ask me <laughs> um, how we met we actually met through some mutual friends at church. Josh was, I think he was interning at the time. 
to be a pastor. And I was just showing up on a Sunday with my parents. When he asked if he could marry me, one of the criteria my dad, I think, gave Josh was, um, okay, you have, to, you have to have a job, you have to have a car, you have to have like these five things. And so we had to start checking some things off the list <laughs> if we were gonna be able to get married. Um, we had no money. <laughs> to put it lightly, we had no money. But my parents also had a lower level of their house that was finished, um, like an apartment. And nobody really wants to live with your parents when you're first married, but it was the only way we could afford to figure out how to do this. So for the first year of our marriage, we lived with my parents. So I started a clothing consignment business. And I had gone to the tech school for business administration, and I really didn't want to do anything in life other than to run my own business. And in that time, um, Josh had left the church. He was trying to figure out what to do, I guess. And also on the side, he was tinkering with helmets. When I was 32 weeks pregnant, I felt the baby stop moving. And so, um, of course, that's alarming. <laughs> At that far along in your pregnancy, that's alarming. So we went in and had an ultrasound. Waiting for that appointment to come, I had also been working, this was like my first big job. Uh, a costume company in Los Angeles, through a, a recommendation from another person, contacted me and they said, we have all these helmet liners that we want to have reconstructed so we can use them in the movie industry. Would you like to have that job? And I said, absolutely. Really had no idea how I was going to pull that off, but I knew I couldn't say no. Every test before that I had passed, you know, every ultrasound, every blood test, nothing, nothing had been out of sorts at all. And it was the longest two hours of my life. <laughs> Nobody said anything until the tech went out and said, um, I'm going to go get the doctor now. And and that's never a good sign. <laughs> so she went out and the doctor came in and he sat next to me and he took my hand and he just said, before I say anything, I want you to know that you did nothing to cause this. Our son had suffered a massive stroke in utero. Really, really massive. Basically his entire brain was affected by it. I had about a month where I had to wrap my head around what he was gonna need. They told us he'd be blind, he would never walk, he would never talk. I mean, cognitive abilities, they really couldn't say as far as that went, but just based on what they saw in those brain scans, it was going to be extensive. And when I heard that, there was no way I was gonna have a crib in the back of my store with a, with a baby like this. It, it, was gonna, it was gonna be my new job. I'm coming home from Marshfield Clinic the whole time wondering, you know, what are we gonna do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And then I come in the driveway. The entire garage door, you couldn't see it. It was all boxes from Western Costume. They sent me 800 helmet liners from FedEx, and there they sat. And I thought to myself, this is what's going to keep me home. This is, this is it. We're going to be OK. So from there on out, it was just research and development. Research, research, research. I, I have um, helmet books that I've worn out and had to get new copies. Helmet books that I've deemed as total rubbish and have thrown away. The truth of it is, is you can even take a rusty M1 helmet and put it on eBay. You don't have to have it look pretty, you know, and it would still sell. Just because it's a relic, I mean, because of what it is. It was just like, well, can I take this to the next level? How many times can I do that? Once, twice, 10 times? Well, how about I produce enough product that I can do it forever? Sam was born in, in 2003 in February. At that time, I was working on about a dozen helmets for a movie called Saints and Soldiers, and I had agreed to, to make the primary character helmets for that film. You know, we're like, try not to die inside because we know that in a matter of weeks we're gonna have, we don't know if he's gonna be born alive, be, you know, is he gonna die in childbirth? You know, <clears throat> he was <laughs> he was a strong cookie when he was born. Like I said, I'm glad I didn't know any better because um, 
that would have that would have been bad if I would have known like oh sometimes babies just sit there and they look around my baby didn't <laughs> um, I literally had him strapped to me all the time day and night because he couldn't see I never knew how he actually felt but it's like his nerves to me were like cut wires like very sensitive to sound and light and temperature change and just all those things very sensitive so everything made him cry you know, he never crawled, he could never ambulate his body, so I had to do everything for him and to carry him up the stairs. And it, and then I was pregnant, carrying him up the stairs, it wasn't, it wasn't a good scene. I knew that I had to make J. Murray Inc. work, no matter what, because I could not think of any other line of work that I could do that could allow me to literally drop everything on a dime and miss 10 days of work in a row. You know, having a special needs child, there's a crisis every day. There's something that happens every day that is scary and, um, in Sam's case, life-threatening. And I needed him here. I've been out here cranking, and all of a sudden, Simon will come running in. Sam's having a seizure. And you go in there, and the kid's turning blue, and you don't even have time to get him in a car seat, and you run into the ER, and poof, 10 days go by, because that's how long it took for him to recover from that. That, that's happened multiple times, scary. And there's no way that we could have, either one of us, I don't know how either one of us could have held down nine to five jobs. Couldn't have, I couldn't have done that without Jay Murray Inc. I mean, I owe a lot to the helmet community um, because people are very gracious when I'd shut down shut down or be gone, or I'd have to put up a message that would say, you know, I have, I, I gotta be gone for a couple days, you know, this is what's going on. And I've, I've done that a few times. And the helmet business gave us that. I mean, it gave us the flexibility and the freedom to be here for our kids. I don't think a lot of people live that lifestyle. And I think that, I think we're lucky. Um, I think we're lucky that it worked out that way. I have really been pretty hands off with his customer base up until probably the last year. I see names come through on orders and that's all I know. I've never met these people um, face to face. We couldn't go out and do um, some of these military shows where we set up and um, our vendors and you get to meet these people face to face. Um, we couldn't do that because of the level of care our son needed. And so for like 14 years we didn't we didn't go out and do any of that because it was too hard. When our son passed away a year ago, um, a lot changes in that moment. And um, we realized we could, we could go. And um, part of that, you know, not just for us on a personal level, like, oh, we could take a vacation. What is that like? We could start to meet these people who have been faithful customers of ours um, and supported us. And so we did do that this last year. We didn't have a proper funeral for Sam. We felt like, you know, you know, I don't know how you have a funeral for an angel, right? So we just kind of had a get together. And right away, you know, you're kind of walking the perimeter of the room because there's photos and different things you have set up. And in and, and there, there was a, a gift from the Airborne Demonstration Team. This year marked the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and they went to Normandy and did um, a commemorative jump as an Airborne team. They asked if they could carry our son's picture. And um, they didn't know, they didn't know the, the symbolism in that for me. Um, I always wanted Sam to be free of his body because it really, really held him captive his whole life and he was never comfortable in his own skin. And I would, I always use the reference, I just wanted him to fly free. It meant more than they knew. It meant more than they knew because they didn't know that that's what I used to say about him. I don't think I realized the kind community of people that were in this, in this helmet business that he created because I, I couldn't be a part of it for so long. And just in the last year, I've been, I've been seeing that. 
And um, it's heartwarming that people really do care um, beyond just the product you create or you know what you show on social media or how your website looks or any of that. It's, it's integrity. I think people really care about that. Um, Josh is really good at being authentic. <laughs> and I think that you don't find that a lot anymore in the world. We really like to show our best side. And um, Josh doesn't really care about any of that. <laughs> And it's what I love about him and it's what I hate about him. <laughs> but he is authentic in his job with the product he turns out. He is authentic with being a father um, and being a spouse and with relationships with people. And that was my favorite part, I think, about being there at these shows was people would wait in line to talk to him. <laughs> you know, he thinks that's, that's pretty funny, but they really appreciate what he does. And as his wife, I loved hearing how much they admired him as a upstanding business owner, to hear what a good guy he is, and it's consistent. It's consistent. And that tells me that all those years where I wasn't present in the shop and I didn't know what he was doing, he was running a really upstanding business. Um, that's what he was doing. <laughs> And he was being honest with people and helpful and, you know, giving them something that they enjoyed doing. If he receives something in the mail and it should be untouched for certain reasons, he will not do it. And he will call the customer and say, I don't think you know what you have here. That is one of the misconceptions about his business that he's gonna ruin this piece of history. He's just authentic to me in every aspect of his life. And um, I don't think you can go wrong with that. I don't think you can go wrong. You, in the end, you just, you stick with that and you will get rewarded for it. You know, I'm not a reenactor. Um, I do collect helmets. You know, for me, 20 years in, thousands of helmets have moved through my hands, thousands of them. Nine out of 10 will pass through, and other than the thought required to make it shine, it doesn't speak to you. I'll still be rifling through a pile of helmets and I'll stop because I'll pick up a certain one and I'll just be looking at it. And to everyone else, it looks like all the other ones, but for some reason, one will just speak to you. I think that's what I understand about why guys choose them to collect. What is it? What is it about the M1 helmet that you can look at it in a certain light and it's just, it's a beautiful thing. And I think because it's unmistakable, when you see the silhouette of an M1 helmet, you know what it means. But I always think about the time that I drug my gramp out to a show and he was sitting there in a chair with me while I was selling my wares and talking to people. Around the corner came a group of German reenactors. And you always know when the German reenactors are coming because of the boots they wear have hobnails, so you can hear them clack, 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 clack on the ground. It startled my grandpa. Now he's 80 years old and he shot up out of his chair just like he was 18 again. And it startled him so badly that he had to go inside of our motorhome to like take a time out. And I will never forget that, ever. It's the first time I ever saw him scared. I, I just saw, I saw him, I'm like, there's just so much behind that face. He's like walking wounded and he's 80 years old. And you, you can be a, a warmonger, you can be a pacifist, pro-government, you can be anti-government, you can be a Republican, you can be a Democrat, it doesn't matter. But when you see what these guys, when it, when it manifests like that, and you can see it. For me, when I look at a helmet, it just embodies that, that 
call to service and that, that sacrifice. I never, I'll never <clears throat> truly know, you know, I saw him that day and I thought that's, that's a heavy cost. And so for me, <clears throat> you know, and, and like I said, I mean, lots of things leave this shop hundreds of helmets a year and not every single one you know you don't shed a tear over every one but I think there's that underlying uh, passion or responsibility or or I guess it's what I try to put into each one and it's subconscious at this point but that's kind of it's important to me